Hopefully you are all here for the Evolutionary Psychology panel. If you're not, you're in the wrong room. Um, I know they're all going to back me up on that. Um, I am not the expert on this panel on anything that we're going to be talking about. Uh, my name is Stephanie Svan. I am here to mostly moderate. Uh, so I am going to let my guests go ahead and introduce themselves. Um, Indra, you want to start? Sure. Uh, my name is Indre Viscontis, and I'm on this panel in part, I think, because I have a PhD in cognitive neuroscience. So I represent the psychology side, but my background really is in um, much more in, in hardcore neuroscience. So I did single unit recording. So I don't know why there's a buzz on my mic, but um, I did single unit recordings from the hippocampal cells of patients with epilepsy as they're trying to build new memories. And then I did some functional MRI work um, looking at those different subregions of the parts of our brain that are involved in forming new memories. Uh, and then finally, I worked with patients with dementia who in the course of their disease, as they lose their ability to communicate verbally, sometimes develop a, um, a skill for and a passion for creating new art, uh, particularly in the visual realm, um, as the part of their brain that no longer uh, can use language seems to release some aspects of the back of their brain, which is their visual cortex. So that's my background. Okay, and I'm Kesey Myers. I'm a biologist at the University of Minnesota Morris. And like Indre, I actually have a PhD in neuroscience as well. That's, that's where I was trained in early on. However, all of my work was done on much more interesting organisms. <laughs> Fish and grasshoppers. <laughs> you know, things that are simple and stupid enough that you actually have a chance of understanding some little fragment of what they're doing. <laughs> uh, but uh, otherwise, since I've become more of an de evolutionary developmental biologist, since I'm really interested in <coughs> evolutionary problems, and that's how evolutionary psychology came to my attention. And I'll just say ahead of time, my bias is I despise it. <laughs> is that a bias or a conclusion? It's both. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay uh, well, my name is Greg Layden, and I had, I, uh, I'm a biological anthropologist. And when I was in graduate school, just about the time I graduated, uh, two researchers, a, a, a person in psychology and a person in anthropology, with whom I shared an advisor, um, had a, gave a talk in room 14A at the Peabody Museum. And the, one of them gave it to, of the two, one gave it all talking, and he put a big square up on the blackboard, a big rectangle. In the lower corner, he wrote DNA. And in the upper corner, he made a little box and wrote behavior. And he said, I'd like to propose a project whereby we work out what's going on in the middle from a scientific perspective. And that was John Tooby and Leda Cosmides who gave that talk, and they are the parents of evolutionary psychology, and that's what they named it. They had been working on this for some time as their theses, and they were just coming out with publications then. So I was there when it was born. And it wasn't as ugly of a birth as you might have thought. But I, I, and I, I think they're right. That what I just said that they said is correct. You know, that's good. But it, it, evolutionary psychology developed and became a field unto its own, and we can talk about this later. But it has certain premises and tenets. And my research was in hunter-gatherer studies and human diets and things like that. So I was I I found right away some things that I didn't like about what they were saying. So I spent the next seven or eight years going to their conferences and complaining to them <laughs> about certain specific issues. And then I eventually got tired of it and stopped, and no one ever listened to anything at all. That's why I'm still here. <laughs> um, I'm Amanda Marcotte. I'm the only non-scientist of the non-moderator panelists. Um, I'm a journalist. I write about a variety of things, uh, mostly feminism, politics, stuff like that. I'm here, I think, to mostly translate why evolutionary psychology is so attractive in the media, and particularly some of the more problematic um, narratives that it sort of generates in the media. All right, and eventually we will open this up for questions, but because a lot of people have a lot of ideas of what evolutionary psychology is, um, we're going to start by taking this back a little bit to the basics. And so, Greg, you were there at the start. You want to give us kind of where it went from the, those sure. little boxes. Yeah, it, actually, with these days, when you use the term evolutionary psychology, uh, I just did some Google searches and, and so on just a couple of days ago in preparation for this, and it turns out that the word, the phrase means anything about evolutionary biology having to do with human behavior to a lot of people. But that's not what it is. What it, what it really is, and I checked a 2010 publication by David Buss et al., which sort of reviews everything, 
it still is the idea, not that our brains or our behaviors are somehow affected by or shaped by our biology or our evolution, and, that's, and then beyond that you can do interesting things, but rather our brains have domain-specific mechanisms that, have, that, are, that are relatively specified as to their neural connections that are largely coded for by genetic programming, but developed in context of the environment that they grow up in to do certain things well, which means that we're probably also not good at doing certain things, certain other things. And that, that's different than just having a brain that's shaped by biology or evolution or that can learn things. It's, our brains are not a general learning mechanism in this field states. Our brains are shaped by evolution and programmed more or less genetically, but again with developmental factors, to be good at doing certain things that are the things that our ancestors living on a serengeti like ecosystem in Africa for two million years were faced with. That's what evolutionary ecology is pretty much defined as. And that's how it was defined in the beginning, and those things haven't, those definitions haven't really changed. And the Bust at all 2010 article actually goes through those specific points and says why they're still right, despite various kinds of, and they have makes some good points, but despite various criticisms, that, in other words, the evolutionary psychology was sticking to their story pretty much as it, as it was back in when Cosmides and, and Tubies and Tubi and Barco and so on came out of the ritual. So, Indre, that, that makes some particular claims about how our brains are organized. Are they? Uh, they're certainly organized. Um, and there's certainly a lot of, there are a lot of different layers of organization in our brain. And so, for any given person to understand a, how a particular function, for example, is represented in the brain, um, you really have to look at all these different layers. And I think that one of the ways in which evolutionary psychology sometimes glosses over some of the important details is by choosing a level, say the level of um, fire, uh, a set of neurons firing in a circuit. Um, and forgetting that every time that neuron fires, depending on which neuron is firing with which neuron, um, the way that it fires the second time is going to be changed, right? Depending on um, how those connections change with, uh, with experience. Um, so you can, you can look at the brain in, in so many of these different layers, and there certainly are some parts that are more modular than others, um, particularly when you look at the architecture of the brain. So if you look at neuroanatomy, um, you can see very beautiful modular organization, you know, in different parts of the cortex, you know, um, and different regions of the brain, of course, have very different architecture. And certainly these have evolved, right? There are some parts of our brain that are older phylogenetically than other parts of the brain, um, cortex versus some of the more, what we call the reptilian brain or the limbic system, um, parts of our brain that are involved in emotion. But you're then putting this, you have to put it back into the context of the brain works as one thing, and certainly there are multiple systems involved, particularly what I say, which is memory. There are multiple competing memory systems. Sometimes they compete, sometimes they cooperate. Um, but I think when you, when you really try to nail down a particular function, either in a particular region or at a particular level, um, eventually you're going to have a problem, because the brain doesn't act in a vacuum, and it's highly interconnected, and that's what makes it a brain. So, that's the caveat, I would say, when you're trying to figure out the modularity, although there certainly is, a, you know, it's highly organized. Um, Amanda, you're probably best suited to talk a little bit about the kinds of behaviors that evolutionary psychologists are really saying are selected for. Well, and one of the things that's interesting to me about, and, and is a big problem with evolutionary psychology, particularly in the way it plays out in the media, is that humans have a whole host of social and other kinds of behavior, but they focus on sex and gender to an extent that is a little bit obsessive. Um, and often evolutionary psychology tends to sort of promote and perpetuate these rigid gender roles where women are um, undersexed, are um, submissive are kind of vain and frivolous and men are naturally violent, aggressive, oversexed, um, and I don't, you know, status seeking I would say. And I don't know that they generally have the evidence that they say they have that these sorts of behaviors are ingrained and not um, taught to us, socialized. And, 
I think that these kinds of behaviors, these kinds of stereotypes of men and women are something that the media loves to like cling to because inherently I think our sort of media systems are a little bit conservative and we like to be told just those stories about why we are the way we are because it's easier to do that than it is to to listen to people who are demanding radical change. And PZ, so they're telling us that these behaviors have been selected for, that they have been adaptive. What kinds of criteria would they have to meet to show that, um, in a, to show the behavior is selected for, and are they really doing that? I know they're not really doing that. You know, I, Greg made that interesting point that when he was in the Tubian Cosmides, they, they set up the program and said, let's find the connection between the DNA and behavior. And I think that's a perfectly reasonable goal, although really ambitious and complicated. <laughs> so we, we'd love to know the connection between DNA and behavior. Unfortunately, what's kind of happened is that the way evolutionary psychology is structured now, all they look at is the behavior and then they infer the biological basis for it, the genetic basis for it. But they don't actually do the work of going in. You know, if, if you're doing um, any kind of population genetics, if you're doing evolutionary biology, I expect you to look at the genes, okay? Evolutionary psychologists do not look at the genes. They assume the genes. And what that often means is that when you look at their assumptions, they're naive and simplistic. That, that, that so often what you see is, is an imaginary line, a dotted line drawing directly from a hypothetical gene to a behavior. And that's not the way it's going to work. That as Indri was saying, when you look at the actual brain itself, it's all interconnected, it's a, it's a spaghetti tangle of wiring, it's all linked together, and, and it's really hard to say that this piece does one specific thing. You know, there's, there is not a coloring in the lines module <laughs> in the brain. There is, not, there is not a module that says, you like broccoli, right? It's, <laughs> it's much more complicated. And it's the same way with the genes. There isn't a one-to-one -one mapping of genes to behaviors, but they assume it is. They always argue that it is. Uh, so that, that's, that's a fundamental error. If you're going to talk about evolution of genes, you've got to start with the genes. So, Greg, do you think they need to start with the genes? <clears throat> yeah, I, I guess... Uh, I'll I, ask the anthropologist. You know, I, I think that, I think Pizzi's right. I don't think they actually, though, infer. I think they actually just assume, even, right. the connection. And, uh, uh, okay, there's two points I want to make. I think I'll just try to make one of them right now. I think that there are, I know from my own reading and research that there are systems of behavior, complicated systems of behavior, in which a set of outcomes over here is obtained, and a set of outcomes over here is obtained, but the things that cause those outcomes are distinctly different. One of the most dramatic examples I can think of is, you know, eating an antelope, killing and eating an antelope, or a deer. In one system, wolves eat deer. In another system, humans domesticate dogs. And dogs do things to deer when you're hunting. Only they're not deer anymore, they're now sheep. And the sheep are acting like prey animals, and therefore they can be herded by your domesticated wolves. In both cases, you sit down and you eat a steak. But in one case, you use a whole dog. Completely different sets of animals are being done. Now, I, I think it's probably true that there are behavioral things within organisms that work that way, too. The actual genetic, hormonal, developmental, and neurological parts that, come, that end up with a certain behavior may be very distinctly different in different individuals. And one good example of that, which is actually evidence, is reading and writing, and how humans deal with certain other linguistic things that are in a more technological domain. And it's harder to prove these things are going to be related to male in, indiscriminate behavior and female choosiness or something like that, which is a, a classic idea. Um, so I, and I think that that would be interesting to study. Uh, much more interesting than, than having a normative system of behaviors that you then assume have basic modules underneath. I guess I, I'm going to make my second point really quick. For several years, every year, I did a, a, a study for John Tooby. I did, I did a favor for him, which I did an experiment with several students. And the experiment involved giving them a, a series of te two tests. And one test, they were given a certain logical problem they had to solve. And the other test, they were given the same exact logical problem they had to solve. But in one test, it was a problem involving how to figure out how a temp had fucked up your files. <laughs> You're a file clerk, and you have to figure out how the temp that came in messed them up. 
And the other one, you're a bartender. You have to figure out who at the table is lying to you about their age. And the students pretty much got 85, 90% correct answers as a bartender, but they couldn't handle the file clerk thing. 2B claims that this is because we evolved more like as bartenders on the Pleistocene savanna of Africa. Where, no, this, this is valid. You know, you have to you know who's lying to you. As a hunter-gatherer, you've got to know your social relationships, fine. So file clerking doesn't matter. What I would argue is that we actually have grown up in, a, in our own world in which who lies to you matters, your friends, your parents, your siblings, and not as file clerks. That if we were, lived in a society in which file clerking was something you actually did as a child as, as play, and you grew up in doing this, and you know, as, a, as a, if this is part of, if this is a behavior you normally encountered. And we know this, for example, that males and females test really differently on things that have to do with special relationships of, of objects until both males and females start growing up playing the same video games. And then they test the same way. And so I think, yes, there are modules in our brain that are, that are there that can be good at certain things, but I simply would argue that for the most part, 90% of those modules emerge because of our experience and our background and 10% of you know, genetic imperative or something. Whereas the evolutionary psychologists would argue the opposite percentage. I want to pop in and point out one other thing that jumps out to me about that example. He did this on college students. Yeah. Well, college students are obsessed with trying to get into bars without <laughs> right. proper identification. <laughs> this is a problem to think a lot about, and I think that, I mean, maybe that, that, that goes to the, the problem I think a lot of people don't understand. Like, the, the reader in an audience reading an article that a journalist has written about a paper that's been published, they often have no idea who the studies were even done on. And these, and these weren't even the students that, that show up to get the five dollars. These were the students in my class, and it was an option. You could skip the rest of the lecture, or you can, or you can sit there and take this test. And, and most of them would sit there and take the test. I just want to jump in, and um, Greg's really come up to something that's very uh, critical to the, our understanding of the brain, which is that the brain is very plastic. We used to think that you know, you were born with a certain brain and then once it finished developing, no new neurons were born, that was it, you just went through this slow decline. Um, we know now that's not true. In fact, there are certain parts of your brain, particularly the memory regions, that actually grow new neurons even later in life. Um, and, but what I wanted to, even at the simplest level, at the level of what a neuron, a single neuron is interested in, right? So a neuron communicates with other neurons by either firing or not, it either sends an electrical signal downstream or it doesn't. It's binary. But what it fires to, what causes it to send that signal can change depending on your conscious environment. So I actually watched this happen in some of my patients when we were recording from their hippocampal neurons. When I told them, I need you to remember now this particular face, um, a cell all of a sudden would perk up and start firing in a way that was indicating that it was marking whether this particular face was novel or familiar. But when I had that same person doing a different kind of task, like for example, drive a taxi through a virtual town and pick up passengers, that same cell would have a different uh, thing that would set off its firing. So for example, it, would be, it, would, it might become a place cell, so it would only fire when the taxi was in a particular location in space. And so we see the sort of receptive field of these cells change depending on what the person is doing, even at the level of single cells. I mean, when you think about it, that's amazing, especially if you're trying to say that the brain is modular and that this region does that. Well, it totally depends. It depends on what you're thinking about, what your goals are, how you've been raised, what you've done, um, because the brain is plastic. And Greg also brought up an interesting contradiction within the field of evolutionary psychology. Uh, one peculiarity, and I really think it's a peculiarity because it's not a necessary conclusion at all, but you find it in the literature, is that they argue that all of the relevant evolutionary changes occurred 10,000 years ago or more. They basically say that you have to explain everything in terms of Paleolithic hunter-gatherers as if anything that's happened since <coughs> is negligible in its consequences on our biology. As Greg mentioned, reading, writing, things that we, you know, this group in particular, we do this all the time, right? This is what we're focused on in our, in our lives. And this apparently is not of any significance at all in evolutionary psychology, which you know can't be true. The, the fact that these, these primitive hunter-gatherer brains, again, that's their inference, not mine, that it's primitive, uh, can adapt and read science fiction novels is 
kind of amazing, right? That's got to be plastic. I don't think it's genetic. It's, I mean, it's a capability of the brain to adapt in particular ways. There's a study in Russia on the silver foxes that was started 50 years ago about breeding domesticity, and they've started recently about breeding wild stuff, and they're showing that there's differences in the genetics. How would that come into this? Um, and I'll just repeat the question. He's asking about the silver fox study in Russia uh, in which they several years ago, started breeding essentially tame foxes, um, and they saw, when they were selecting for behavior, uh, quite a few changes in um, physiology and that sort of thing. Um, and he was asking how this would be connected. I, I would actually say that there's a couple of important points in that study. One is that uh, this is, these are capabilities that are present, present in the silver fox population. It's, it's so quick that it didn't require mutations what it required is novel recombination of traits already present in the population. And I think that's another thing that evolutionary psychologists downplay is, is the genetic diversity present. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you shuffle those, you get combinations, and, and, and it, uh, by the way, they also selected for more feral foxes, foxes that were more aggressive and, and violent. And that work too was very easy to do. Uh, the other important point of that study is the significance of pleiotropy, which I think ties into everything we've been saying here, is that all these things are interlinked in complicated ways that when you select for dom domesticity, what you end up doing as well is you end up selecting for traits like different pigmentation. Uh, they found that the foxes, the more domestic foxes had droopier ears, for instance, like a, like a dog. Uh, they, had, they, they tended to have spotted uh, coats rather than uniform coats. Uh, lots of things like that happen. So everything is tied together genetically and you change one thing and it may ripple through and cause all kinds of other consequences. I expand a little bit on the EEA concept as it was brought up. <coughs> the, the, the idea is that, that, as you said, they want everything to relate to things that evolved that happened 10,000 years ago or more. Um, that The concept is the environment of evolutionary adaptiveness, which is difficult because the word adapt adaptiveness doesn't exist <laughs> in this term. But the EEA, um, when I first heard that word and I went to these conferences, I wanted to find out more about it. That was what I, that was my main criticism of the EEA concept. And I remember going to my advisor, Herb DeVore, and saying, where does this, where does the word come from? Have you heard of it before? He said, yeah, I think I read it in Balbi. Check Balbi. So I went and looked on his shelf and I found, actually, the Bible. And it was an interesting Bible. It was given to Herb when he was a child preacher. And I went back and said, you were a child preacher? But that's another story. <laughs> Balbi, I finally found it. And Balbi has a chapter called The Environment of Evolutionary Adaptiveness in this psychology book. And it's got a footnote. It says, uh, the term environment of evolutionary adaptiveness, is the first sentence, refers to the period of time over which a trait has undergone selection. Footnote. This idea comes from a conference I attended at which the idea was suggested by, um, by Herb DeVore who was the guy who told me that he thought he heard it from Balbi. But anyway, <laughs> the point is, in, 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 the, in the original Adapted Mind, the book that put out the first papers on evolution psychology, there's actually a, a book, or actually an article, explicitly stating the EEA concept as being the savanna of the Serengeti, which it says, this is the environment in which people like the Bushmen would have been living for two million years. The, and, and the paper explored our interest in bonsai trees, and certain other landscaping things. So you had an individual lone tree on the land, on the landscape with the vast grassland, and that's a, a, an aesthetically preferred or nice thing to us, which is maybe true. And that is because we evolved on that environment. That tree would be important because it would run when you're being chased by something. What's absurd about that is the Serengeti is full of archaeological sites of that of the that represent human prehistory. But all of those archaeological sites, all of my gorges on the Serengeti, all of those archaeological sites represent are, are, are known to be wooded and forested areas and very different from the living Serengeti. And if you go to the Serengeti now, the place where the Lion King was, quote, filmed, you know, like that place. Pride <laughs> 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 Rock is really there. It, it doesn't look exactly the same. They actually went and drew pictures and made that. Anyway, if you go to there, what you'll find out, what you find there is that there is not a single primate living in that open Serengeti habitat. Because you can't be a primate living in that habitat. Water is too far away, and the only water you can get to is surrounded by lions, and there's too many predators. <laughs> there are lots of primates in the region, 
but they're not on the Serengeti that the Bushmen supposedly lived on, and the Bushmen don't live in the Serengeti either. They live in thousands of miles away in the Kalahari. And the nearest hunter-gatherers are the Hadza who live sort of in woodland. So the point is that, that they, this was people, I'm convinced, who had knew about human evolution stuff. They went and visited all the Vigorge. They went and visited places in South Africa. And they did their tourism stint on the Serengeti and were in awe and wonderment about the Serengeti as a place in which we evolved. And they were visiting it from inside of Land Rovers as tourists. <laughs> and just made that mistake, made that connection very erroneously. And that's why we're stuck with that very, very cartoon version of the environment of evolutionary adaptiveness for humans. Yeah, another thing about this too is like, I think a lot of the things that evolutionary psychologists do are make assumptions to simplify their lives and to give yeah. cartoonish versions of what they're what they're explaining. And and one of the things you find is this 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 idea of the Paleolithic <coughs> hunter on the grassland. But as you know well that's not a situation in which you get one uniform type of culture emerging. That it's that, that Africa is extremely diverse, and they're ignoring the fact that this one environment can generate thousands of different kinds of lives out of it. Uh, so how can you then take a particular pattern of behavior and infer back to an environmental fact? And their counter argument is, ah, but you're still being chased by predators, you still have to meet. And they, and, they, and they will have a list of things that are still true for everyone, and they are still true for everyone, but they're also true for old mice. Yes. And well, house flies and everything else. So at this point, we now have the EEA applied to life in general, and therefore, all organisms should have choosy females and promiscuous males. Right. I, I read one paper by an evolutionary psychologist that was trying to pin down this idea of modules in the brain. Okay, they, was, they were going to show us that there actually are these modules in the brain, and the one they found was the amygdala. Okay, now I, maybe you don't know, but the amygdala is everywhere. <coughs> Fish have an amygdala, amygdala. So, how can you justify saying that this is a site for specific adaptations for human beings when it's something so universal? As Andrew was mentioning, you know, the brain is very well organized, it's got a structure to it, but a lot of this structure is ancient and it's not going to be defined by events 10,000 years ago on the African savanna. Well, and the, and that's interesting. They said the amygdala, which is made up of a series of nuclei, right. and it's not nearly the what I what I thought you guys were going to comment on. And I want to jump in and just play devil's advocate for a moment. Is that the reason they picked this timeline is because there is some evidence that the ratio of neocortex, which is our sort of newest part of our brain, the part of our brain that seems to be the most different from other species, uh, to the rest of our brain, increased exponentially around that time. I mean, you know, there is a certain time in which we see these graphs of whether it's skull size or, you know, we, we can sort of trace back this big leap in terms of our brain size, brain ratio to body size. Um, and it makes this leap, and so people point to that Part, as something happened there that we you know, needed to adapt this bigger brain and so we dealt with this whole birth canal issue and you know now we have the fourth trimester of the women you know the babies are born totally useless because their brains would be too big if they were born at, when they should be born which is at 12 months rather than nine months anyway that's why people sort of point to that time period and you know you brought yeah, up but the time period they're pointing to is not it's two million years. Right. right? <laughs> well, I don't know if it's two million. Several, certainly tens of thousands. Oh, I think well, it's million. No, it's, it's explicitly <laughs> two million years. And in yeah. and, and, and two years, right? It's explicitly two million years. And it's two million years of the Pleistocene, which is the most dynamic period. And it's Homo erectus as a species. And Homo erectus is the first hominid to be found in increasingly diverse environments and altitudes and habitats. And so you're right. I mean, it's well, ridiculous to point to that. And I want to point out that I don't think anybody on this panel. Um, and, or any of the critics or skeptics of evolutionary psychology would deny that certain things like, you know, human women carry and breastfeed their children and that's somewhat, you know, that's just part of our species behavior. I don't think we deny anything like that. It's just the, what they start to extrapolate from that, I think, is, is what we're calling into question. Yeah, and, I, and I, so I, so I guess the, the point I was trying to get to eventually was that, sorry, it was so long-winded, is that the part of our brain then that seems so different is certainly not the amygdala, it's the frontal right. cortex and the neocortex and all these other regions. And so, you know, if we're going to look at anything, we should look there, and, you know, of course, that's the most complicated part, too. Yeah, but that, that's what I was finding, is that when you, when you actually find evolutionary psychologists who are willing to talk about the real data and get down to the basics, 
Uh, they can't point to anything that's unique to humans in the last 10,000 years. They have to go to things like the amygdala or breastfeeding. Now, that's a mammalian characteristic. We've got 80 million years of that to, to discuss. Um, it means that the stuff they're talking about, the very specific stuff that they're testing on college students, they don't have genetic or biological evidence for any kind of difference. I would like to uh, just emphasize at this point that we're talking about good evolutionary psychology. <laughs> we haven't even gotten to evolutionary psychology as practiced by economists. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I did. It's kind of um, right. It's more for Indra is the current position where the evolutional brain is right now, as opposed to men and women. <laughs> you can see that women are much better multitaskers. You know, far better memory than men and stuff like that. Um, no, you can't. <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, there's so much BS about female and male differences in the brain that it's, it's, it's well, unbelievable. Well, the thing is, like, if we do our awards at college and stuff like that, and for the Phi Theta Camp and stuff like that, consistency, the school has got the same amount of men and women, but five times more women are that matter coming to the top of the scale of uh, educational level. I'm just wondering if you see that, that there's some type of uh, difference between men and women because clearly we're seeing. Well, maybe, every, maybe, nobody you know, denies that men and women are generally different. I mean, if yeah. they weren't our, in our culture, you wouldn't even be able to spot who is male and who is female on site. But that's not because of biology. A lot of that's culture. <laughs> I mean, why do women make different choices than men? Well, a lot of the time because that's what is coded as female in our culture, and that is always adapting. So something like, you know, being good, at being bookish, you know, and, and spending a lot of time studying is something that in the 19th century was considered very masculine, and, and actually that women were not smart enough for that. Now our culture thinks women are the kind of the smarter, more bookish sex because that's something we associate with being sort of indoorsy, a little bit more personality submissive, whereas we encourage boys to run around and play and, and our masculinity in our culture is coded as being a little anti-intellectual. So it's not a big surprise to me to see women excelling in college beyond men and then it also isn't surprising to, to me to see that not reflected in, in economics because once you get into the job market, like things like behaviors we code as masculine, like being aggressive and competitive, start to become more relevant. And then, you know, in terms of the bottom line of neuroscience, so there's one major difference between men's brains and women's brains that I can say unequivocally is true. Men's brains are bigger. Men have bigger skulls. Men are taller. Men weigh more. So that's a big physical difference. Now that's not to say that if you look at the details of the distributions and you know so forth. So so obviously you know if you're gonna you know compare a big population of men and a big population of women, you might find some differences in terms of at least brain weight. Now again, how we use that brain is what's really important. And in terms of the functional imaging studies between men and women, there's far greater individual variability between individuals than there seems to be between genders. And um, one of the reasons why sometimes you know, we see fMRI studies that are you know, all male or all female is simply because when you're comparing different brains, size matters. And when you have to put them into a, an algorithm that's going to compare different you know, functional characteristics, um, you need to make sure they're all pretty much the same size. So because men have bigger heads, um, you know, we might use them <laughs> for one study because you know, women have smaller heads or whatever, we might use them for another. And that's, so that, that's, that's where we are. But in terms of, I would say, a consensus in neuroscience between man, men's brains and women's brains, um, the, the counter studies far outweigh at this point, uh, the studies that show that there is a significant and replicable, replicable uh, sorry, excuse me, replicable difference. Yeah, and year, years ago I was, I was actually a participant in some research where we were analyzing brains for sex and gender differences where you get these thin sections of a region, a, a defined region of the brain, we're looking at the magnocellular area of a portion of the cortex and what we're doing is collecting statistics on are there significant differences between men and women, between men and 
gay men, between men and lesbian, etc. You know, doing all that. And the, the end result of the study was that, yeah, you can sort of see a statistical difference between men and women, but as somebody who was sitting there doing the data collection, oh, it was, it was a mess. There were cell sizes all over the place that, uh, that we saw clear evidence, for instance, that if a person was malnourished to death, they had smaller cells in this area. So there are these environmental effects that disturb it, uh, which means that even when you do see an anatomical difference in fine details of the brain, it may be a consequence of culture as well, and you just can't sort it out. So it's possible it's a society thing, and it's men are It's almost certainly a society thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's almost certainly a society thing. It's probably um, an economic thing, uh, because at this point, uh, men are still somewhat, not nearly as much as it was, say, 30 years ago, still somewhat able to make a living wage without higher education. Women are not, they mostly haven't been. Um, so that has pushed a lot of women into education and into, they have financial incentives to excel. Stress and things like alcohol affect your brain. So you know, if we did your brain studies before this weekend and after, <laughs> <laughs> you can see effects. Yeah, in science, we, we, most of what we do in science actually comes down to, which is the opposite of what you do in, in journalism, is I mean not you but yeah. journalists is we try to we try to play around with the variation Probably. Sy systems that don't have a variation are not interesting and whereas instead of describing the normative here's the bottom line the central you know theme and so let's just look at you know the, the range of sex differences in humans there's a huge number of studies that have been done that show all different kinds of sex differences how do we explain the variation that we see and one of the variations you see is the change in the parent sex differences over time. So if studies are showing differences over time going away or emerging, then this is not deep genetic differences that are explaining those variations. Um, there could be developmental ones. Also, the brain is an organ. Okay, You would not explain someone's triceps on the basis of their ancestors' triceps as far as the basic size, as much as how much they go at the gym and do certain exercises. Okay, The brain responds to its environment, so that's a source of variation. So what's interesting is that different people with different perspectives, it's like if I wanted to explain to you why you feel better or not today versus last week, and I'm a homeopathic you know, practitioner, I'm going to do everything I can do to convince you that it's a homeopathic remedy I gave you that explains the variation in how you feel. Okay? And if I think that genes are really important in determining behavior, I'm going to do whatever I can do to convince you that the genes are, 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 are explaining the variation of behavior that you have. Having said that, I think that there are remaining interesting differences between individuals that may map out onto males and females more than, random, more than just randomly on different people in the brain that have to do with some things. And I don't know if they're going to be one away or not having to do with, for example, linguistic-related issues. You, you, you seem to have um, deficits in, in, in language learning still much more often in, in, in young boys and in young girls. And you still have a larger number of simultaneous translators, for example, being hired out of females and out of males uh, populations. And so there, I think there may be interesting things going on there. Um, but. But still, again, if you went back 20 years, you'd have really solid evidence in experiment after experiment after experiment of some certain sex differences that have gone away with differences in childbearing. And, and, and certainly sex hormones affect the brain, right? Both during right. development and right. later on. This Testosterone is why, poisons male brains. Yeah, this is why uh, estrogen <laughs> therapies, for example, have caused women to have terrible memory problems. This has been well documented as well. So, you know, there, and, and so anyway, there, there are hormonal effects that can be related to gender. Yes, you have a um, do you think the reason why we, we play up the sex so much is because we're predisposition um, genetically to categorize things? Or is that just something that we I out? think it's because um, so much of our society depends on the gender differences that we've created. And, um, you know, it, it, it's almost subconscious how much we get invested in the systems that we already live in. And it's hard to imagine a system that, that wouldn't have such divergent gender roles, and it scares people.
I think people are kind of naturally conservative. I, you know. And trying to figure out what a society without gender roles would look like is really hard for a lot of people. So, um, would it play biologically though? That's the, the question mostly. I mean, would would something would we attribute something in our brains to a society that wouldn't have it versus a society that would? It's really because hard to say. Um, the thing is, where we see differences, we tend to come up with reasons for differences. So if we have um, differences between genders that are held up by societal expectations, um, we living in that society may be relatively blind to all of the the societal norms that are around us, but we still see that there are differences. We see that these people do this thing, and these people do this thing, and this applies way more than gender. Um, and we come up with reasons for that, and some of them aren't very good. Um, some of them, you know, social, social sciences are, are still not exactly in their infancy, but you know, we're, but I think we're doing some work. an important point there, and this is something that's been I, a criticism that's been levied against evolutionary psychology for many, many years is that there is this human trend to want to find explanations. Even if you don't have a good one, you know, you want there to be a reason why your Uncle Fred died. And it can be God, or it can be genes, or it can be whatever, but we've got to have some kind of explanation. So how did so, that drive benefit our hunter-gatherer ancestors? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that it did, because we seem to do it even more when those differences cause problems. Um, something that things, when things are in a particular way that, that causes problems, that cause particular people pain, we actually do more work to explain them because well, they wouldn't be there if there wasn't a reason. Or sometimes just when they're like completely random. Like, I mean, definitely, for instance, to, to speak to a, a completely random gender difference is the association of pink with girls and blue with boys. That evolved utterly randomly. Utterly randomly. It was just marketers needed a color to give to boys so they could sell boy clothes and girls so they could sell girl clothes. And they picked those colors at total random. And now you're actually seeing evolutionary psychologists <laughs> trying to come up with reasons that our brains are wired by our hormones to, in our genes, for boys to prefer blue and girls to prefer pink. But there's no, I mean, that gender difference was only sort of invented by marketers who realized that they'd sell more clothes and toys if they gender differentiated them. I just want to get back to one of the other points that the um, participant was making, which, which was about categorization and our need to categorize ourselves. There is a strong pull to define yourself as either an in an in-group and then figure out who's in the out-group, right? Who's threatening to me? Who who is my friend? Um, and you know, gender seems to be one way in which we can do that. We can talk about that and we can write papers about that. Well, race used to be one way in which we would do that too, and now it's become very taboo for good reason. Um, but you know, there is this question whether you know how whether it, if it wasn't taboo, would we be doing all these studies about racial differences in evolutionary psychology or you know in, in anatomy? Um, and you know, I, I'm not sure that. I mean, I, I just think that that's sort of something that we need to think about about how much of it is our categorization is is cultural. It's cultural. It's not necessarily you know, in our neuroanatomy. I can predict with 100% certainty if it wasn't taboo, we'd be seeing a slew of more IQ papers, be, like, on blacks and whites. And, and they haven't yeah. gone away. No, we, we do see it. We just don't yeah. read those journals because they're boring. Yeah. You don't make it in the New York Times. Yep. Um, well, I'm uh, two things. One, a really interesting thing about the uh, pink is for girls and blue is for boys thing, does that actually change? Hey, pink was originally associated with boys because it was like blood, whereas blue is just the sky, and you know, girls can have the sky, and then it ended up switching for some reason. And I was also wondering, um, so, um, there have been um, changing differences between the gender line with males and females and what things are associated with them. Uh, how much effect do you think the amount of hormones, like birth control, or other such things that have become a lot more popular recently have affected that? Or do you think it hasn't had any effect? 
one interesting observation that could be made, that's a good question, is that birth control pills probably, in a sense, mimic the environment of evolutionary adaptiveness in the Serengeti that we <laughs> because, you know, in the absence of natural birth control, um, of, in the absence of, of industrialized and effective chemical birth control, and you know, your, your, lactational uh, uh, amenorrhea keeps women relatively infertile. So a woman who has a baby and it lactates for a long time, and for various other traditional ways, doesn't have a baby for four or five or six years among hunter gatherer groups. So not having a period for six or seven years, and then having a period for a few months and getting pregnant is probably kind of more normal than having a period every month for several years. So in a sense, the, in, the, so in, in a way, ironically, the birth control pill may actually make it for a biologically less risky and more normal setting in terms of hormones and so on. Well, the, and the research that has been coming out sort of suggests this, doesn't it? I mean, they've been doing research that shows that because women tend to pace their children a little bit better than they did, you know, 50 years ago, you're seeing bigger brain sizes, better nutrition in the second child than you were. It's kind of interesting. And plasticity everywhere. That's that. I think that would be really the message of anybody who wants to oppose evolutionary psychology is they downplay the importance of developmental plasticity. Did we solve a question? Uh, I didn't want to point out uh, that there's uh, evolutionary psychologists who are still um, making these racist pieces in uh, Satoshi Kanazawa, yes. Who yeah, is an are economist. Some, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wasn't kidding about economists doing, evolu <laughs> I mean, doing it, evolution. It, it comes up periodically, like some, some conservative think tank will just cough up a writer who says, you know, we need to study the IQ differences between blacks and whites more, and then Andrew Sullivan will always back him up. <laughs> and, and then a bunch of scientists will come out and say, no, that's bullshit, and then, like, it will die. <laughs> and then it'll come up every few years. I mean, I th we had it this year, so we're due in 2016, I think. <laughs> One of the recent developments there has been, and this is something that's happened, this actually happened since the 19th century. This is sort of how the British did their whole. British invasion theme, you know, colonizing the world. Um, some cultures and some countries are simply smarter than others. And this has come up a few times. Uh, it came up several years ago, and Robert Clickgard wrote a book on why African countries are, are corrupt. It, it's innate corruption. He actually came to me, he was referred to me to talk to an anthropologist about support for his book, and like, how does this really work? How would it work genetically and so on? It's pretty interesting to see that conversation. But uh, the same place, think tank, Kennedy School of Government, has come up, which is a pretty liberal place normally, uh, has come out recently with some research on comparing countries' IQ. And there's actually a paper coming out uh, in a few months or so in the American Anthropological Association, or the, or the in current anthropology, uh, that will be addressing that particular claim in those books. It will be a very interesting. There'll be a big controversy when that comes out. The paper's so, going to bring it So there's like the corruption there. gene, perhaps? Or should, a corruption I, module in the brain. I think this like <laughs> brings up the question, like I think a lot of people do assume IQ is genetic, but I mean, that's certainly not true, is it? No. Well, you know, how do you measure IQ? It's intellectual quotient, <laughs> right? It's such a, it's, it's so culturally specific in so many ways, you know. Um, are, yeah, is it vocabulary? Is it you know? And of course, we as psychologists come up with many different ways of measuring it, and we try to make it you know cross-cultural, but it's extremely hard, and no one's come up with a great measure that doesn't change with time. So if you look at the IQ over the course of the last hundred years in the U.S., it's gone up and it's gone down depending on how you measure it. And of course, it's what's happening is that people are getting better at testing, or they're getting more exposed to whatever it is that the doctors are measuring, and so then they create new tests that have a better measure. And so, you know, it's it's such a general thing that it's so difficult to get an answer to that. The, if you actually trace back the IQ papers that keep coming out, they all go back to an original early literature, which is which was kind of congealed by Philip Rushton, and which has a series of studies referred to a series of studies on IQ which includes two of our favorites, which is one which was done at Yerkes Primate Center for the contract for the Army in the early version of Yerkes. 
as a contract uh, for um, class, class scripts, determining which class scripts should be given training to become officers and so on, in a largely non-literate society at the time of World War I. And so it was a non-literate IQ test. That non-literate IQ test was given to young girls in a school in Zululand, South Africa, in the 1930s or 1950s, as a part of an apartheid government's directive to scientists to prove the inferiority of black people. And these girls got an IQ rating of about 70. And this included, they, the one question they all got wrong was showing two people, uh, uh, stick figures of two people wearing tennis whites with tennis uh, um, rackets and no net. And they're asked, being asked, what is missing in this picture? That was on the text, <laughs> and none of them did. Um, I, I used to give my students a test that was similar, and I would show two men standing there with a, well, obviously a Zulu warrior uh, shield and a spear. One man standing there with a Zulu warrior shield and a spear, and it's from a Zulu ceremony. And what is missing here? And that is the guy pretending to be a lion. <laughs> <laughs> so that IQ test, that IQ test showed that Africans have IQs of 70, and Philip Rushton knew somehow that African Americans had a 20%, 80% white black admixture. And, and then he saw this persistent and largely environmental difference in kids in schools and getting IQ with rankings of about 20 point difference, and explained that as a genetic admixture. And that is a convincing argument that IQ is genetic that is ultimately referred back to by every paper, refers to another paper, another, and ultimately refers back to this one, this one study that links these things together, which has been debunked and thrown out, and not to mention the fact that Rushton linked it to brain size by having blacks in the sample have small brains by taking the measured brain size from using hat measurements from conscripts in the army, estimating the brain size, and then re reducing the black brain sizes by a certain percentage in every case because Africans have thicker skulls, which they don't. <laughs> he based that on using the Bodo specimen, which is a Neanderthal. And, uh, and, and then he adjusts all of his, so that's where Russian race uh, concept comes from. Blacks have small IQs because the hat size measurements are, are simply subtracted. Something subtracted from every measurement if you're black because we assume you have a sticker skull. And then there's the great irony there that they've discovered that it's white people that have more Neanderthal in them now. Yes, and also, and also a sticker skulls. Uh, old skeletons from Africa tend to have thinner skulls. Yeah, I see a lot of shaking heads out there. Anytime you think, no, they couldn't have done something that bad, <laughs> somebody did. <laughs> I think the, the moral is if you ever see a study that talks about IQ, you really have to look at how they measured it because that is so controversial in the psychology in the literature. What are the good parts of evolutionary psychology? <laughs> <laughs> That's a really well, hard question. <laughs> I like the jokes that the actual biologists make about them behind their back. <laughs> really good stories, right? They, they take something that's really complicated and they distill it out and they make it a good story. And I think that there are sometimes, you know, sometimes by doing that kind of theorizing, we can develop a better model for what we want to study and what we want to look at. And that, you know, the problem comes when we take that as fact and then stop there instead of saying, hey, that, that's an interesting story. Let's go test it. Yeah, the problem isn't what kind of things they came up with. The problem is that they have done all this research that either only supports it if you don't pay any attention to what somebody over there is doing, or contradicts their own theories, and they haven't thrown anything out. I will say, I, I, I will give them credit for this one thing. They have popularized the notion in the public consciousness that our evolution impacts who we are. And that's actually true. And I think it makes explaining certain other concepts, like when you're trying to explain cognitive biases to somebody and why our brains kind of trick us into seeing things that aren't there or misunderstanding something, I think it's a lot easier for an American audience to sort of understand that because unfortunately it was evolutionary psychology that primed the well. There's actually some good studies, some good studies that people who claim themselves to be evolutionary psychologists have done. Um, if you go to just go to the UCLA Department of Anthropology and look at Dan Fessler and Boyd and so on, Boyd Eaton, uh, and uh, there's a handful of people there doing interesting work, and some of it is basically has to do with proclivities and things. I mean, you know, interesting tests where you can you can find out that humans react to certain environmental cues in certain ways consistently. The underlying theory that these things are genetically shaped 
you know, or evolutionary shaped sets of genes that inevitably lead to these outcomes is still in there and that's still probably wrong. Because evolutionary psychologists started out with a really interesting hypothesis that they then assumed was just true. And it's never been tested, which is that we have genes that shape modules and that those genes are under selection because the modules are where the rubber hits the road in some selected milieu. And it's just never been tested. The modules may still well exist in adults, and they're doing some interesting studies at places like UCLA looking at those modules and identifying them and defining them. And it's interesting, um, but it, it, it just doesn't really prove the point that you have this EEA in which these genes are shaped and so on. Uh, and, and that's why I would, I would categorically say that there aren't any good evolutionary psychology studies. Um, I know that's, that's really harsh of me, but I, I think it's the case. What there are, though, are good people within the field who go back to basics and do good work. Uh, for instance, there are people like Sarah Blaffer Hurdy, who does a lot of cultural anthropology. I think it's phenomenal stuff. She's actually looking at the evidence and not making ridiculous assumptions from it. Often when you read her papers, what you find is she's, make, she's testing some assertion made by evolutionary psychologists and finding it's wrong. So I guess that's, that's the that's our guideline. If they find something wrong with evolutionary psychology, they're good people. Don't <laughs> assume <laughs> evolutionary psychology and human behavioral biology are the same. Right. Sarah is not an evolutionary psychologist. She's a behavioral right. biologist. Right. So. That's, that's what I mean, is yeah. that where you find good scientists who often get appropriated by evolutionary psychologists yeah. within their field, is they're doing more fundamental research. I'd also recommend people like Robert Sapolsky, who's looking at you know, the effect of hormones on the brain and looking at, at, at evolution of primates and things like that. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff out there that sort of fits within this domain. It's, you know, the question of how did the brain evolve is a legitimate one. It's a good one. Uh, it's just that I think that the premises of evolutionary psychology so taint the field that it's it's basically a dead end that ought to be discarded. It's you know it's one of these interesting things I want to kind of point out. Like I often very frequently get requests to debate an evolutionary psychologist in a public forum. And I always decline and offer them to, or to refer them to a biologist who is willing to debate them. And they always take a pass. <laughs> and I think that's very telling that they want to debate a journalist. Somebody with no PhD, no science background, who likes science but doesn't really understand it to the same extent that the, the, people, the rest of the people on this panel do. Um, that's just something I want to put in your brain. Yeah, you know, one of the things you notice about popular evolutionary psychology is it's often simply fodder for tabloid journalism. That's where their brains are at. There's something, there's something adapted there. Anyway, um, when, you, when you read the stuff that makes it in the popular press, it, it's always about similar sorts of things. IQ studies get mentioned a lot particularly if they cater to populist biases that the blacks or the immigrants are, are dumber than the good native people. Uh, if it's about women, it's how women have are, are passive or sexual aggressors or sexual weirdos and men are the dominant one. You know, they, they constantly play up these sorts of differences because that stuff gets rewarded with notice in the press. And it's really unfortunate. I don't, I, you know, good studies like like I mentioned Sarah Blaffer Hurdy, who's got a whole book on, for instance, the maternal instinct, and basically shows it's a bunch of bunk that women do not have any kind of maternal instinct. Uh, that didn't make it into the newspapers for some reason. It's not a popular <laughs> feel-good sort of story that fits into our notions of motherhood. And it's funny that we keep circling around to class. Even the sex differences is a class issue, because once, uh, well, most of his research, and historically, sex differences have been supported and asserted by men who are the, the, the higher class sex when it comes down to it economically and power relations and so on. So it's, it's not even biology. In terms of yeah, this is a common theme in many many of these popular evolutionary psychology articles too. Is that that women are the passive recipients of the male genetic heritage? Yeah. There was this recent there was this recent thing. I, Maybe you've heard about the menopause study? Yes, yes. I, I, I yeah. stomped around my apartment for about five minutes after reading about that. Yes, yes. <laughs> men get it to women because women have absolutely no control over their reproductive impulses. Yeah, the theory was that men basically induced men, menopause into women by stop, by stop 
stop fucking basically <laughs> once they get too old to to be attractive anymore which apparently hits you at, at what i guess 45 uh, 45 50 in their theory yeah well that explains why it's called menopause <laughs> <laughs> and if you read the study there's, there's absolutely no data to it it's entirely a mathematical modeling study where it, it, where they're basically saying hypothetically if, if we, have we these make these assumptions Yes, we can generate a model in which women go barren after... I always like to tell myself to like, if they're going to tell just those stories, I tell just those stories about the scientists as my motivations for this. <laughs> and the ones I told myself after reading them were pretty great. <laughs> All right, we are technically out of time, but if any of our panelists have any last words that are quick last words... I would just like to point out, though, that there is a resurgence of the interest in, in the relationship between genes and behavior, and I think it's one that is really well worth studying, particularly in an area that is um, being fired up um, about it right now, which is dementia. Uh, you know, we're facing this huge problem in a few years where the number of people with dementia is just going to be uh, unbelievable. And yet it turns out that there is some genetic component uh, that we can start to study and that by treating particular um, people with genetic changes, you know, we might be able to find a cure for some subtypes of dementia. So there is a hope that eventually you know, we're going to find more links between genes and behavior um, and then be able to use them to make our lives better. And I, I'll agree with that. that I, there, there, is, there is a sound basis, there's a material biological basis to how the brain works. I agree 100% with that. Uh, and I will say that even I am doing research on genes and behavior in my lab, but I do it on fish where you can do real experiments. <laughs>